Welcome to Crimson Guitars, welcome to my home studio, welcome to the insanity that is me and this and us. And uh, we're all here, it's a Sunday evening and uh, we're here to talk about guitars, guitar building and and why I choose to sit when I normally stand and why I choose to sit on a particularly creaky stool. I, I don't know. I, I had completely forgotten it was this loud until we got to that... Well the point where it actually pushed start so welcome creever i said yeah already 20 seconds late i was here four or five minutes early set up good to go started watching uh, a little bit of yesterday's video to see how the edit came through and i thought ha huh, minute to go click the camera on and of course it pulled up an error and uh, there we go. Anyway, we have Rabnox, we have Spice Guitar Garage, Dimitri's in Luthifer, 1971 Silver Surfer, who asks, has Ben reached his driveway yet? Uh, it's been one of those days, but but I've been here a while. <laughs> it has not been a Friday. If I still was doing the Friday live streams, uh, this week would also have been hugely problematic. Franz Struter is in the house, as is Lisa. How you doing, Lisa? Stephen Clark. Uh, talking about a broken fret end dressing file. Fret end dressing file snapped out of nowhere. Generally, those things require some sort of pressure to, to break, but that is a fret end dressing file. Fret end dressing file. That's the fine, fine, delicate, beautiful things. Uh, yeah, uh, that that is not fun. I sincerely hope it was not one of ours. Uh, if it was, let me know, though, because... That would be that would be interesting. <sighs> okay, Divergent Guitars, Rob Tootill, Toot M Carman. I haven't seen you in days. <laughs> uh, Garage Master Guitars. Uh, we're all here. We're all here. So uh, greetings, real KH. Uh, Okie dokie. I require questions. Sean Fahey says, I'm back with my Redbush tea. I know how to party. I uh, uh, I have just finished, not Redbush, but decaffeinated tea just before I came live. So for fun. Okay. Uh, okay, Richard Keel. This is a question via our Discord, I suspect. says, does anybody know if it would be realistic to try and use a normal Strat-style tremolo on a multi-scale instrument? Nothing drast drastic, just a slight variation like Nebula here. Uh, Nebula is a scale, uh, Fender scale, at the longest to a Gibson scale at the shortest. So there's a variation of just an inch. But even short of drastically modifying saddles, there is no way that you'd even be able to get an inch of variation on a on a standard trim, the standard strat trim, you, you you need that much variation in order to make it work. Uh, you could potentially cut saddles in half and remachine them so that you use a much shorter saddle uh, where it needs to be, or potentially much much longer ones. So yes, it is possible. It's a um, well, it depends on how much time you want to put into it, and do you have the ability to machine brass? I mean, we all do. Everybody can use a file and a hand drill. So, a very good question. Uh, my thinking is that Strat saddles have a good range of movement for intonation adjustment, and if the parallel point was quite far up, maybe around the middle, it could work on paper, but would it be playable? It would be playable, but I don't think it would work on paper without heavily uh, heavy adjustment. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, uh, William Polchek says, So Ben, what do you think about Project Hail Mary? I love that. That is the uh, uh, the new book by uh, the gentleman that wrote The Martian. I can either remember his name or the name of the book. Never at the same time, though. I, 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 I don't know. Um, fantastic book absolutely amazing book i particularly love the story of how the martian was written and if you haven't seen that yet uh, check it out he, he he was eking it out a chapter at a time for free on the internet and ended up being 
a major movie sensation and a successful author. It's awesome how amazing life can be if you've got people like you guys supporting uh, supporting you. And uh, yeah, it, it makes me... I like watching it happen. It's very cool. Okay, uh, Scott R. Hampton says, Did you know people bet on how many jeweler saw blades you'll break during an episode? <laughs> Uh, it, it does not surprise me. Uh, the the best was the best was when I made the very first cut and broke a blade within the first ten seconds of this cut. Uh, it really is one of those things. Um, buy cheap, and sometimes you might. There was a time where I had particularly cheap fret saw blades, and I literally could not finish the guitar on time. It was one of the timed things because they kept on breaking, because they were just rubbish. So yeah, buy slightly more expensive blades uh, when you are there. And funnily enough, the very next question is from Sven Nystrom, who says, sorry if you've answered this before, but please tell us what blades you use for your fret saw, uh, or jeweler's saw is really what it is. Uh, they're interchangeable. Uh, the ones I find would never allow me to cut that logo out. Okay, so, and this is where I shouldn't be sitting down, because I need to turn around. It's been a long weekend though, I'm tired and I'm going to sit down for a bit. Okay, so, that's not a jeweler saw, that's sterling silver tube for putting in a, a guitar in there. Ah, here we go. Okay, so I... I'm now buying my blades from a UK company called Cooks and Gold, and uh, I have bought the Lorb, and I use generally. Four huh, O or three O, the Lorb uh, blades, and that's what I've been using for years, and they are incredibly well made, and if you keep them in the Ziploc bags. Um, is Ziploc an American uh, Americanism? I'm not sure why I said that. I've just found that both bags were open. They keep for a lot longer. Now, the other thing, though, is that these, that Cooks and Gold do do a budget uh, European-made saw blade that actually feels to be, if not exactly as good, very damn close and whether they have a law or not you are going to break them so they've their their good quality budget are cheaper but still very very good so that's what i use and i can't find i appear to have i appear to have run out oh no more silver uh okay Anyhow, sorry guys, Organian Evolution says I think my next project is going to be a restoration on my 1986 Washburn RR11V, um, now that I have half a clue what it really needs, let alone the ability to do it. Uh, is that half the ability to do it or the ability to do it? I think the ability to do it. Jhammer42, uh, question, when plugging neck and pocket holes, does wood type and grain matter? No. Uh, essentially, you've got a very small hole. As long as you super glue it or glue it in properly, and it's a nice tight thing, but not such a large piece that you actually force cracks and things uh, but yeah grain wood type makes zero difference the glue is more important and the fit so there we go uh, um oh okay so no we do have an image of this fret and dressing file and it is a crimson file so uh yeah, that is really strange. Uh, okay. So that's Sven Clark. Sven, please get in touch with me via Crimson Guitars. Um, 
shop at crimsonguitars.com say Ben told me to get in touch uh, my fret and finishing file snapped uh, I would like to see a, a few more photos of it so that we can see if there were any visible issues but I will replace that with with I'm going to say the word pleasure but you know what I mean I'm going to replace it I'm not happy I have to replace it I'm not happy that it broke on you but uh, we'll send out a new one uh, if you get in touch hmm yeah if there wasn't very much pressure but anyway Okie dokie. Deck Void says, what? No colourful stains or inlays of copper foil? Where is the hollow plane held together by toothpicks and illuminated by LEDs? A plane with humbuckers. Now there would be a thing. <laughs> so this is alluding to, to yesterday's video, which was a restoration of a beautiful Spears Air panel plane. Much like this, much like this beautiful Matheson panel plane that is also in need of uh, some restoration although not as much um, I will not lie I've been having I've not been feeling very well and I've been feeling very 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 busy as is evidenced by the fact we've gone down to one uh, live stream a week uh, but the issue is well, there's many, many, many things, but I was not happy. I was not in the mode for Nebula. And uh, at that point, I was still waiting. I was still waiting for this. Pick up. I'll stop teasing you. So, here is the pickup that we've ended up with. Uh, mini humbucker size. We've got vintage gauge fret wire in double rows going all the way down it's got its own little base plate it's machined out of ebony with a radius on it and it just it just looks absolutely incredible now i do have a little bit of work to do to it for the video but but not much and uh, I also have some very, very interesting ideas for the bridge design, but I could not finish the bridge's design until I had the pickup. And due to the fact that, hey, prototyping brand new pickups actually takes time, I, I only got this pickup on Wednesday, I think, which then gives me a day or two to do a whole video for Nebula, and Talitha has to edit it as well, and we just, I was not prepared to rush. And, uh, there we go. Um, but anyway, it is what it is. Let's get back onto back onto the questions. Uh, now, what is this? This is episode forty-two of the live stream. Uh, Ninety-four of us currently watching. That's fantastic. And uh, yeah, if you if you super chat, that's a way to get questions absolutely onto me. I haven't seen that many questions in the chat yet so uh let's see oh <laughs> robert r says i'm pretty sure i saw the stack of guitar tops i sent ben a couple of months back in the background of the plane restoration build video hi robert you are a fantastic fantastic individual and i'm i'm really 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 grateful um that it's some incredible timber uh, i'm not going to i'm not going to tease uh, the video I actually filmed an unboxing of it because um, well because I felt that that would be interesting uh, and uh, I suspect that's going to be going live next week looking at the wood looking at the whole process and just saying thank you um, I am uh, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bury the lead bury the lead jump the shark jump i'm not going to jump the shark there we go watch the video when that comes live and uh, but you need to know i am incredibly grateful uh, it is essentially top and back sets for ggbo guitars two top and back sets and uh, some incredible myrtle uh, so i'm going to be having some fun uh, electric lady guitars devon uk says hi ben question recrowning frets are previously dive from 14th to 22nd 
would you start by uh, okay so pre dive from the 14th to 22nd is no, now I've forgotten the term for it <sighs> fall away uh, would you start by flattening all the frets or level in two stages much more than this eddy okay I if you know that there is fall away there already I would level in two bits i would level the main neck and uh from zero to you know 14 15 you're probably gonna remove a little bit of the fall away and then you go back and then do the fall away uh, there's no need to get it all the way down in fact that could be very very bad if you did that uh, so there we go Dimitri says, I'm thinking of upgrading my workbench. Any suggestions? There are a bunch of good books. If you want to build one yourself, there are a bunch of good books uh, that go through the process and various different options, and they are inspiring. The problem is a good bench is a hell of a lot of work and uh, takes a hell of a lot of time and is problematic. No, no doubt. It, it really is problematic. So I, I would suggest if you don't have huge amounts of time uh, or a burning desire to make a workbench. And most, and that's it, most woodworkers have a burning desire to make a workbench because it's what they want to do. They want to make furniture, they want to make chairs, they want to make, and that is, making a workbench is, if nothing else incredibly good practice for that sort of joinery and that sort of process while we might be interested in making high-end jewelry boxes or a good quality chair or something like that our prime reason for having a workshop is actually building guitars and anything that gets you to building a guitar faster is worth it in my book and that's where we where we're at. So I built a workbench. It's giant. It's far too big. It's really heavy. Uh, I do think that the month or two I spent doing that would have been better spent doing an inlay or practicing my fretting at that point in my life. So uh, so yeah, we then talk about buying commercially available workbenches. Now, at this point in time, I do not think that a single commercially available workbench is going to be absolutely fit for task unless you're spending thousands of pounds. Uh, I would suggest that pretty much any bench you buy, including this one that I've got here, uh, I can't remember who made it. It's not a Schoberg, it's another Danishy sort of a company. Uh, it's not heavy enough, it's not solid enough. Uh, I need to remove the the shelf out of it and put uh, probably actually some old drawers in I need to I needed to raise it up by four inches and that's still probably too short to be honest uh, so yeah I would suggest you could probably buy a relatively budget bench Axminster Power Tools do one if you're in the UK uh, the benches that we use at, at the tool shop uh, we did get a discount but it was a discount because we were buying 18 benches. It wasn't a discount for me to, uh, you know, as, you know, advertising or what's this influencer bullshit. It's it's none of that. Um, we went and we tried a bunch of different benches, and that was the best bench at the best price that we could get to fit out our score. And they are good benches uh, with you know good quality vices and bench dogs and all that jazz. So there we go. If you are upgrading your own workbench, I would suggest buy a better vise. I would suggest potentially keep the substrate and put a massive top on your existing bench. What I did on my old one uh, that is still at Crimson is I essentially created a, a shelf, a deep shelf, and I filled it with scrap metal. And it made it a lot more stable. If you watch the plane restoration video from, video from yesterday, this bench is very 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 movie it moves a lot anyway uh, so there we go Paul Sellers check out Paul Sellers Elliot Trent suggested uh, a Nicholson inspired workbench design that Paul Sellers makes uh, pretty much anything that Paul does is well worth watching um, it's it's one of the uh, most disappointing 
things in my life that uh, when I met Paul, I said, oh, by the way, you know, fancy doing a collaboration? He's like, nope, don't do those things. Uh, don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. Uh, no, don't do that, <laughs> which is fair enough. Okay. Uh, Sven Clark, he's currently sharpening the teeth on his buck saw restoration. Okay. Uh, mistakenly called it a bow saw last week. I'm pretty sure it's also called a bow saw. Hmm. Uh, I thought that using the crimson fret end file after my standard needle file would be overkill. That is until I tested it on a couple of teeth. Now I'm going back over the whole blade very tediously. Is this where the, the, the file broke? Uh, okay. I'm going over the whole blade very tediously. Any advice for a first time saw restoration project? By the way, this crimson fret end finishing file is boss. So that is obviously before it broke. Uh, Sounds to me like you might have twisted it in between two teeth, which isn't really what it's supposed to do, and that's why it snapped. So, hmm. Anyway. <sighs> Funnily enough, okay, I am not a saw sharpening expert. Uh, if you have the geometry already set, which you do, if the, the, the teeth are already there and you're not having to completely flatten them down. So what you would do often is you get a big old flat file and you run it along the teeth to knock them down so that the tops of the teeth, the tips of the teeth, are all at the same height if a saw has been very, very well used. And you then go and you reshape the teeth. And you can change the TPI, you can change so that you've got uh, fewer teeth at the front where you start the cut than you have at the back where you really get into it and stuff like that. Um, changing the geometry is not my bag and I would suggest go and check out Paul Sellers uh, because he really does know his stuff and most importantly he's done some videos where he explained it incredibly well. So I would suggest do that. Uh, now, in this case, you have a saw that's pretty much sharp, and it just need you just need to retouch up the teeth uh, with your um, triangular file, and it is better to use a triangular file rather than a small, uh, no matter how good the file is, uh, fret end finishing file. So try and find a triangular file with that same quality of finish if you really want to go crazy. But uh, yeah, there we go. Scotsman on Discord uh, sent up a photograph of the neck that he's just built uh, and he's just saying thank you for the facet video. Um, our facet carving trick is fantastic and uh, it just makes a very scary job much easier and I, I, I like it when people um, share photos like this. It's really cool. Thank you. Okay, Robert R says, uh, Ben said he was going to redo his home workshop over the next few weeks. Sounds like a lot of work to me. Better him than me as well. Are you you want to come and help? Um, it's not entirely. I've I've got I've got a lathe there that's in pride of place that I haven't touched since I moved into the since I moved it in place. Uh, my son has played on it once, but you know we haven't. Um, and I recently nabbed a stunning workbench. Actually, uh, if if you can find a good quality vintage workbench on Craigslist or eBay or something like that, you can often get a really good deal, a couple hundred quid for something that you would pay thousands of pounds for, uh, that just needs restoration, much like the plank. I bought a beautiful workbench through VintageToolShop.com, sales still on, sales still on, and um, I need to find a place for it. And this bench needs to be adjusted. As I said, I'm not happy with how solid it is. I'm not happy with the storage solutions. I'm, I'm fine with where most of the stuff is, but that back corner just isn't. It's not right. And I also have an incredible uh, new Triton crosscut saw that needs a home. So uh, I'm going to be unboxing that in the video and doing it. And I really do need to actually declutter. So I'll you know, empty the workbench and go through a bunch of the, the tool collection and bits and pieces and, and, and talk about things that I don't actually need to keep. Um, I think it could be it could be interesting. It's going to be a lot of work, but 
I work better in tidiness, and this workshop has really gone crazy. I need to put a fan in the, in somewhere as well um, to as dust extraction. So I think it'll be interesting. It's a lot for a video, but uh, it will be interesting. And then and then it's going to be back on to Nebula to finish her and uh, start. Okie dokie. Questions, 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 questions. Jeff's guitar says CS Guitars Workbench was as wobbly as mine. It's it's one of those things they all come because they're flat packed, they all come with as little material as possible. It makes it cheaper as well to manufacture. But <laughs> Borgonian Evolution is using, he says we're all spoiled. He's only using a $15 folding table from Walmart as his workbench. Crikey. Ben Timon says, make it heavy as possible. More mass equals less movement. Exactly. Okay, Patrick Nesbo says, question, I am building an Explorer. As you probably know by now, I'm going to put a veneer on it. Is there a way to make it look like a full top and not just a veneer? Yeah, I mean, uh, you could bind the sides, which means that you won't from the edge. No, you won't be able to see. Uh, that it's a veneer. The other option is to just paint the back and sides a solid colour or do a burst, for example. And really, nobody's going to be looking inside of the pickup cavities. I'm... <laughs> Digression. Wolford Guitar says, I had to wait for ages in Axminster to get those benches back in stock after you bought them all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. If that is true, that really tickles me. I like it. Okay. Veneer gets a bad rap. And and it's it's bullshit, really. Uh, specifically in electric guitars, there is no reason to use a six millimeter drop top or a 14 to 18 millimeter thick top unless you're going to carve it so i suppose the, the thick one yes if you're carving it fine but there's no reason to use solid woods on an electric guitar arguably you get better tone using a good quality ply i'm not talking you know um the the shit stuff but if it's a good quality ply with a pretty veneer on the front I do not see an issue with that. And I think it comes down to acoustic guitar builders. It comes down to acoustic guitar builders and uh, or manufacturers who have a big push. Basically, China was making really cheap, really nasty guitars using veneered ply. And yes, in an acoustic guitar, it makes a difference. 100%. And acoustic guitar manufacturers are saying, oh, this is a solid wood one. This is solid wood top, solid wood top, etc. Um, and somehow electric guitar builders and electric guitar players now think that a veneer on an electric guitar is a problem. And I really don't. I think that you can have the prettiest veneer in the world over a fairly boring chunk of maple and the guitar will sound like a maple top, but it's just got a quilted maple veneer that has a lot of the depth and reacts in the same sort of way. It's harder for a hobbyist or a single builder to, to work with to a certain extent. You know, it, it's fiddly, whereas just processing down a six millimeter chunk of wood isn't. But uh, with guitars like the GGBO that we're working on at the moment, I, I would suggest that actually a good quality ply or a good quality substrate of wood that's cheap and easy to get a hold of covered by a veneer would should be the way to go i think it's arguably i'm not sure let me know what you think is that is it more ecologically friendly to do that uh, i know there's more glue involved i don't know six millimeter birch ply good quality veneer all the best wood goes to veneer makers. The prettiest stuff. So you want pretty 
either pay through the back deed or I think I messed that statement up. Or use veneer. Anyhow. Rob Tootill. Would you rather build a guitar with any blade, plane, chisel, scraper, but no sandpaper, or any sandpaper but no blade? Uh, any blade. Uh, I would use planes, chisels, and scrapers. Um, <laughs> um, I could level, I could level, I, you don't have to have sandpaper to level frets. Uh, we do fret rubbers, of course, uh, the fret crowning files, fret leveling files, uh, and if necessary, there are diamond leveling plates which don't qualify as sandpaper. So, yeah, I would use blades and then I would maybe, my ceramic sharpening stones in a pinch would actually do a pretty mean fret. I mean, they'd probably do an amazing red leveling job. Yeah. Okay, we've had our first super chat of the evening. Crikey. Um, Luther sent 20 Canadian dollars. Thank you very much, Luther. Um, I do appreciate it. It says, uh, Ben, when using veneers on a multi-laminate neck, is there any prep you do before glue up? Yes. Yes, because of exactly what happened to you. I had half a neck delaminate. I'm thinking my maple was too wet, maybe. Uh, I'm buying a meter, but maybe I did the veneer wrong. Uh, you're buying a moisture meter. <laughs> I thought you were buying a meter of maple, another meter of maple, for example, and, and I had to think a little bit. Uh, my wife bought me a new veneered water bottle. Um, she looks after me. Okay. Uh, it depends on the veneer. So I use uh, 0.7 millimeter. I think it is poplar or tulip wood or some something similar to that. It's very thin and it is stained. And I buy um, bleached white or stained black. They also do reds and blues and other various colors. And uh, I use that stuff. Now, the staining process, stroke or the bleaching process of that veneer, means that I have actually had it delaminate to a certain extent on me. And uh, not normally under while making a neck, but I've had issues while making veneer. And uh, I always now, as a rule, uh, if I'm not sure on the veneer, if I'm not sure where it has been, how old it is, uh, I always sand it down just a little bit in order to guarantee that I've got fresh wood where the glue uh, is going to be meeting. So I think that the stain is actually, um, yeah, I think the stain is in these particular veneers stopping the glue from getting in and causing it to delaminate in, in small areas. So, so yes, that is what I do. Um, now, obviously, a moisture meter is absolutely essential. You all know that I use the incredible Wagner moisture meter. Um, I can never remember. I can never remember the number. It's the Orion moisture meter um, by Wagner. The Orion 950. I cannot tell you. In fact, I need to take this up. Need to take this up to the house because I I do not quite trust the um, humidity uh, tester in my gecko's vivarium, and I want to just use this to calibrate that. Um, that is how good this is. Um, so yeah, if your wood is too wet, then that is another thing. Uh, there is also. Uh, Pressure, too much pressure is something to worry about. I know that when you've got, say, five or six different seg sections with veneer and all of that jazz, the temptation is to really squeeze in and tighten those clamps up to all of your, uh, with all of your strength. And that is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, you could be um, squeezing all of the glue out and causing some 
uh, starving it of glue. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Okay. So, tips for gluing up multi-scale necks, or multi-laminate necks, I'm sorry. Uh, figure out where you're going to have the excess wood and drill a hole all the way through and use a dowel, either a wooden dowel to hold it all in place and drill through the veneers and everything, and that stops it slipping. Uh, one at the head, one at the uh, end of the neck. You could use stainless steel uh, in wax, I suppose, or something like that, so that it'll slip out, or you can just hammer it out. Don't clamp too hard, but also don't clamp too little. So um, maybe a clamping cord is a good idea. Uh, last week, there was somebody who was clamping up a neck who ran out of glue, and he ended up doing, you know, half of the uh, half of the laminate in one pass, and then went back and did the other half later. And that's not actually the worst thing that could happen. Uh, at least everything was clamped up evenly. You could use clamping cords to spread it. You could go and buy a giant hydraulic clamping press to do it that way. Much easier. Um, but anyway, many, many things that can go wrong. Okay, via Discord, this is from Spikes. Says, an acoustic guitar I'm setting up for my son-in-law has a bowed top, making the action really high. I think it is dry inside, according to my research. I have a rag and a baggie with holes in it now, with the case closed to drive some moisture back in it. What should the humidity be in a Fender acoustic to avoid this happening? Uh, the first acoustic I have had in the guitar garage. Uh, glad I caught the bow before I started cutting the saddle. Um, this is not my... This is one, not my area of expertise. I've avoided repairs and acoustic repairs in particular forever. Um, I just... Historically, I have just not enjoyed that sort of work. And... Uh, and that's what it is. But uh, also, it very much depends on where you live and where the guitar is kept. So, uh, yes, there are, um, I think Daddario does a Humidi pack thing, and there are various other companies that, that do those things uh, in order to keep the guitars humidified. And I would say go on their websites uh, for those products, and they will tell you where it's supposed to be based on uh, the various data. They have a commercial interest in it and therefore hopefully have got the data correct. I would literally just be guessing, uh, you know, based on an, it's an informed guess, but still a guess. So I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Uh, Stephen says, talking about veneers, thinking about getting, thinking about my next build, uh, where I will be using a vacuum bag to glue it on. You mentioned last time I used to use a bit of material between the veneer and the bag. Would even a bit of cardboard do? Uh, I think a bit of cardboard would do, but uh, it's literally that white polyethylene foamy sort of stuff uh, would do. Or um... okay, so the issue is you've got a you've got a vacuum bag, you've got a great big bag. It's plastic and a nice, perfectly sanded flat top, for example, that you're gluing down onto a substrate. Uh, as the vacuum bag, which is plastic, hits onto the perfectly flat top. Um, the air is going to struggle to suck between the bag and the top. So you need some way to get the air from the far corner of the bag to the section where your vacuum hose is pulling. So what, you, what we do in that case is we literally just have a thin strip of cloth that goes from one corner to the other. The cloth stops the plastic from smooshing down onto the top. Please excuse me. Oh, I think I broke my neck. Yep, Luthier broke his neck live on on telly. <laughs> Ow. It's better than blowing out the eardrums of a hundred <laughs> watches. Um, only 47 of whom click like. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of fabric will, uh, will stop the the plastic from um, gripping down to the wood and will then mean that you are pulling air from evenly across the whole bag so that's that's what you would do actually a little piece of cardboard would probably have the same effect as well okay
<laughs> uh, Stephen has asked me if I'm going to burn the bridge again this time like the original nebula. Any excuse to use a propane torch? Uh, I have considered it. I don't think I will this time. Uh, but yes. Questions, questions, questions. Toot M. Carmen says, Hi Ben, question. I got some Iwasaki files from Crimson while I was there. Thank you. Uh, I really loved using the ones of Crimson and wanted to keep the ones I bought from you in perfect condition. What is the best, best method for cleaning them and maintaining them? Okay, so obviously store in a dry, um, in a dry area. You don't low humidity at all possible. Um, if you don't have that, then uh, a light uh, machine oil or something like that uh, in a sort of oily rag or something like that will keep them nicely. Uh, it is possible that shavings will get stuck underneath the blade. Uh, Iwasaki files have like 10,000 individually cut um, laser etched or whatever teeth and uh, they can if you go a little bit wrong end up with sawdust mushed underneath them don't use a f uh, don't use a file cleaning brush to get rid of that I would very carefully go in and just pop it out with a brad awl or the tip of a scalpel blade or something like that um, other than that it's just a case of make sure you cut with the grain wherever possible and uh, yeah, they, they're amazing tools. They last a, a very long time. And yeah, they're, it's it's an incredible thing and well worth keeping. Uh, Inky Guitars via Discord says, Hi Ben, question. If I pour molten copper onto an oak guitar body, <laughs> um, will I end up with a flaming coppery mess? Burn it. Uh, or a copper covered body? And would putting a layer of wax onto the wood help? Uh, no, putting a layer of wax onto the wood would have the opposite uh, effect. I have, many years ago, I tried to do the exact same thing with molten aluminium. Uh, I only just managed to even melt the aluminium, let alone make it work. And what it did, what ended up happening was the aluminium burnt the wood and just fell off. Uh, now, the only way to make it stick in is if you, for example, have a lovely knot that you want to fill, you need to then go in and back carve the edges to essentially dovetail the cavity. So when you pour something in, it will grab onto the wood and, and not fall out. Um, the problem is this is wood. And it's going to burn and you're going to burn away your back filling. So it might work. It depends on the wood. It depends on the holes. It depends on how much copper you've got. It depends on how hot you get it, um, how quickly it cools and, and all of these things. It is so worth trying. But chances are it's doomed to fail. I made a very basic blow forge out of the cheapest little camping barbecue thing I could find, completely forgetting just how hot a blow forge would get and immediately melted through the, the, the barbecue thing. It just just terrible. Okay, uh, Neil Jelks says, Ben, uh, question, I want to cut the fret tang ends, then file the ends of the fret slots, sorry, fill the ends of the fret slots with dust and glue, but how do I also glue the frets in for the gap under the frets? Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, basically, it's, it's exactly the same as you normally would. Uh, put the glue in on the center of the, of the slot when you're putting the frets in, and if you do have any squeeze out, meaning that the gap is entirely filled all the way through to the end, while the glue is wet, just use a toothpick or something smaller, an E-string maybe, uh, to remove a little bit of that white glue, because we tend to use white glue, uh, just wood glue, to fill those slots. 
Um, yeah, that's what I would do. Alternatively, actually, <sighs> you could. I'm toying with the idea of uh, actually using dust and glue underneath the fret as well. It's probably not worth the effort, but uh, but there we go. Jeremy Cole says, can you install T-nuts under the fretboard of a bolt-on neck before you glue on the fretboard? Are there any issues to consider? Um, no issues. Yes, you can. Absolutely. It uh, essentially means uh, you've, got a, you've got a nut underneath the fretboard and the machine bolt goes through the wood. And instead of those nasty threaded inserts that just destroy wood, especially at the edge, the end of a neck, where you want, you, you've got your bolts maybe six or seven millimeters away from the end grain, the end end of the neck. And it just wants to shatter that wood because it's it's not designed for that. Um, so by doing what you're talking about doing, yeah, you, you're gluing something in nicely. Uh, be aware that you don't want to get glue into the thread if you can help it. But even if you do, yeah, you use a standard tap and put it through and you'll be fine. Okay. Konstantin uh, Manik says, big greetings from Russia. How's it going? Uh, my favorite watchmaker is in Russia at the moment. Rob Tootle, another Would You Rather. Oh no, that's the original Would You Rather. There we go, Lisa. Uh, it's talking about fret saws. James Duffin says, I have a torsion box bench and chiseling on it is like a drum. You can hear it down the street. So a torsion box bench is something I've not tried, but is a very strong, stable, good way of making a bench that stays strong and stable. And essentially you've got a chunk of uh, MDF or plywood, a chunk of MDF or plywood, and then you have sections of um, uprights, basically making hollow box sections, much like you would have sort of an aircraft wing made out of wood, that sort of a thing. I would be tempted to to do that, which gives you a nice flat workbench, and then before the top goes on, fill it with sand. Take the top off, fill it with sand. You will not regret it until you move house. But uh, yeah, and that's future you. That guy's, that guy's an arsehole. Current you, he's cool. Oh no, wait, it's the other way around. <laughs> anyway. Um, Uriel Sage says, Ben, question over here. I used a round over bit to get a faux binding effect, but it came out a bit uneven. Fix? Thoughts on how to do it properly in the future? <sighs> um, your, only, your only fix at this point is to go around and sand it carefully and sand it carefully. I am so tired. Oh my gosh. My goodness. Sand it. Uh, unless you go very slowly and you have got a three flute cutter, preferably with um, helical blades, which I don't think I've ever seen actually on a roundover bit, you're going to have some sanding to do after the fact. Now, I do not... I do not use roundover bits very often at all, and definitely wouldn't while doing faux binding. I would literally fine sand the guitar, get the whole guitar absolutely perfect, and then put the stain on very dry. Put the stain on and make sure that the stain doesn't drip over the edge, and then you're essentially creating the faux binding at that point. And then if there is any bleed over, you go and you scrape that clean or sand it clean in much the same way. It sounds to me like you put the stain on and then used a router. I think. I think that's what it sounds like. So you need to go in there with files or... or <sighs> yeah. Files, sandpaper sanding blocks, leveling files even, would actually be quite a good way to, to go through there. But uh, yeah, it's it's difficult. Quiver, I just bought a very nice looking low angle block plane. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> um, Uh, 
Okay, Tier B says, uh, my 25-year-old Strat has got some seriously worn frets. I'm a bit scared in case I ruin my axe, but what is the best way to go about putting this right? Uh, okay, and there is a photograph attached. I would literally just use, uh, go through any of the leveling and crowning videos that I've done. The most recent one that got the best reviews, as it were, I suppose, was the... Was it my GGBO build? Uh, or maybe... Shred. I'm not functioning. I'm not functioning. There we go. Yeah, so Shred. Uh, and essentially, when I got to the point of leveling and crowning the frets, I filmed the whole process. That is what you want to do. Um, and uh, currently, the tools are on sale at Crimson Guitars. So, uh, yeah, everything's on sale apart from the three-month course. Here we go. Garage Master Guitars via Discord. How do I finish a neck with a maple fretboard? Yes, Ben, I know you don't like maple fretboards. I just, I just don't. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's just one of those things. Uh, when I want the rest of the neck finished with oil, how do I finish a neck with a maple fretboard when I want the rest of the neck finished with oil? Where would be the transition point? How would you mask it? The fretboard itself, I'd use a rattle can gloss, satin gloss. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, well, the transition point for me would literally be the size of the fretboard. Um, I wouldn't borrow. I, I would mask off the whole neck and spray up the fretboard absolutely perfect. He shakes his head, reconsidering many life choices. If you're going to do that, round over the edges of the fretboard first. That's the most important thing. Round over the edges of the fretboard. I would I would probably actually spray the spray the sides of the fretboard as well, come to think of it. But essentially when you are Yeah. Yeah, spray the sides of the fretboard, um, polish it all up, sand it down, do all of that jazz, and then oil. And the oil should be okay at that. Uh, essentially, if the line of the lacquer is following the line of where the fretboard is glued on to a different wood, it should be it should look fine. The issue is that if you spray the top of the fretboard and leave it sharp, that's a weak point for the for the lacquer to go. You want to round it over. In an ideal world, you'll lack it to the bottom of the roundovers and and then oil the sides, but it's a difficult one. Ben Tymon says he made the Paul Sailor's workbench and it never moves. That's pretty cool. I have been tempted by that. Mark Milligan says Rex Kruger on his website, he has plans for a great workbench as per his channel. Go great. Electric Lady Guitars, Devon, UK, says top tip, bow saw blades cut both ways, uh, I dull turn blade around. Uh, I used to run forestry sharp-edged tools courses at Dartington. Cool. Adam Bartron made the top of his workbench from 26 floorboards uh, on edge and six foot long. Now it takes four people to move it, but it feels stable. Wow. I, I would love to see that, Adam. If you could send us photos of that through the Discord, that would be incredible. Uh, Dimitri says, question, Ben, have you ever built a guitar from olive wood? I think it looks amazing, but I don't think I've ever seen one. It does look amazing. I have not. I have been tempted to every time I've seen olive. Uh, students have also done uh, these things. Um, okay, Kruver has come in with a question about finish. I've tried to get an even finish with many, many, about 15 very thin coats of high build finishing oil, and it is still rather blotchy. There are spots that shined up well, but others that are still dull. Uh, my plan is to use micro mesh sheets, 6,000, 8,000, 12,000 weight with water, and Renaissance wax afterwards. The oil has cured about a week. What do you think? I think that's exactly... There are some... Sometimes, um, now I know that you, the stain that you used underneath was stains mixed from the Stunning Stain shots, the really concentrated stain. 
And there's sometimes that having too much of a concentrate with that stain, it, it messes with the with the oil finish if you're using oil. Um, and I think that's what's happened here. I've seen the photos. I just I just don't know. Uh, but yeah, sanding the whole thing down uh, through the grits with uh, micro mesh and micro mesh and water, and then applying Renaissance wax using a warm rag should get you warm rag, warm microfiber cloth. You know what I'm talking about. But uh, heat the whole thing up uh, with fire because it goes on much better. Inky Guitar says, Ben, how can I bend acoustic sides without a bending iron? You can steal your girlfriend's curling tongs, potentially. Um, you can um, you can get a PVC pipe, a sewage pipe or something like that, plug up the ends and uh, essentially run a tube from your kettle into the pipe, put the... Uh, Put the sides in there for an hour or two with steam going through and then when they come out they'll be floppy as all hell and will just form around the thing hopefully uh, you'll probably need a mold to do that uh, you can use let me check yeah you can use ammonia in much the same way the fumes of ammonia will bend will make most woods super bendy uh, it smells a little bit uh, yeah okay yes uh, Uriel Sage says Ben I stained and then used the round over bit uh, yeah that's I wouldn't do it that way although I do understand the temptation um, the faux binding didn't bleed, the edges are fine, I just wanted it to be visible from the front, about two millimetres. No tear out or anything, the line just came out uneven. Yeah, I would sand it. You have to sand it after you've done the router, basically. <laughs> uh, Lisa says, would you consider using remote controls for Nebula so that you don't spoil the top? It's a little bit late now, there's already a hole drilled in it. But yeah, I mean, that would be quite cool, actually. Um, okay, our second super chat of the night. We're an hour in. Crikey. Um, night YYZ sent $5. Thanks very much, dude. Uh, it says, hi, Ben, it's night YYZ. Z. Night YYZ. Okay, night Y Y Z. I don't pronounce Z in the way you guys do. Uh, actually, saying Z makes me think of Pulp Fiction. Uh, any tips for making purple heart purple again? My beautifully planed chunk has turned brown. Uh, plane it down again. <laughs> That's your only real option. <coughs> okay, so essentially, um, as you build the instrument, it's going to you're going to expose fresh wood um, if you want it to stay purple you have to use a finish that is uv protective period and uh, most finishes just aren't it's just the way it goes but uh, yeah so work away rework it carve it shape it sand it and uh, there i don't know of any I, I have never heard of any other way to bring back that colour. Um, if anybody does know, please let me know or let us know. Um, James Duffin says, Ben, have you seen Matt Esley's workbench Bertha? It's on YouTube and made in ash and walnut. It's super heavy and one of the most beautiful benches I've ever seen. In passing, I have. And yes, I went, wow, that looks cool. And then completely forgot about it until now. Uh, I never went through the process of uh, uh, trying to find... Uh, the build videos, etc., to watch it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't have the time to watch very much of anything, uh, sadly. Um, literally, so this whole year, I think I've watched through four TV series. 
the whole year. And uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, people people find that that strange. I'm currently watching this one on the BBC um, about the V&A Museum that is just incredible. There we go. Robert R says, I've seen parts of a guitar made of olive oil, but never a full top or body. One of the builders for GGBO 21 competition used an olive wood fretboard. This is true. And somebody, uh, somebody, somebody at Crimson, one of the students had some olive. Uh, and in fact, he had it delivered to Crimson. And the person selling it to him said, oh, by the way, please tell Ben that he needs to buy more olive wood. So there we go. Heart of Oak. How's it going, Heart of Oak? Um, the the tea made its way to crimson and immediately gave Ricky sort of an existential crisis, brought him back to a, a whole different job in his mind where he had the same blend somewhere. Um, it was quite funny to watch his, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, Heart of X sent me some tea from Canada that was delicious and uh, is now being shared. Uh, I was drinking far less coffee than usual, you see. Uh, we have a small run in the last coat of clear coat. What way would you suggest as the best way to get rid of it without causing more work for us? Uh, say five Hail Marys and very carefully sand it down and cross your fingers and hope that it works. The issue when you're sanding down a, a run in the finish is that you're using a, a block. It sits down on the run and wants to wobble. So it depends on how, yeah, it depends on how big it is. But what you could potentially do is put a, a piece of masking tape on either side or a piece of veneer on either side and run your, uh, run your sandpaper along that until the top of the run is flat and the same height off the top of the, the rest of the finish. And then you go in, take that away, and then level it down a bit more. Um, that way you're not rocking, you're not taking away finish from either side of the run, and it's a very methodical method. Um, I have seen and I wouldn't suggest doing this, but I have seen people taking a, uh, a traditional razor blade and wrapping a piece of masking tape around either side, so one you can hold it, but also that acts as a, a depth stop and you can scrape the finish down to a particular depth as well. Now, the issue with scraping fresh finish is that nine times out of 10, it works absolutely fine. That 10th time, it hasn't fully cured and it does actually cause horrendous issues for later and you're talking about the last coat of clear coat so yeah just just rub it down and, and hope that you don't um make sure it's fully cured rub it down and be good <laughs> Night YYZ says, sorry, I'm Canadian, but I'll take YYZ. Uh, YYZ, I will try and remember that. Divergent Guitars quotes, Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Um, <laughs> who's Zed? Zed's dead, baby. I need to watch that movie again. My kids are... There are certain... Certain things that since I found, since I first conceived of having children, I've been looking forward to. And one of them is sitting down and watching Pulp Fiction with them. Um, another was Matrix, which unfortunately I did when my, my the, the two older ones were just actually probably far too young for it. But you know, that's parenting for you. Just a series of mistakes. Can you, can you imagine being in my position? Every single child on the planet now wants to make a living as a YouTuber. Can you imagine being me, 
having to say to them, hey guys, it's actually not that easy or viable. It's not a career path that you should probably even consider going down. And I'm like, but daddy, you do it. Oh, I don't play, I don't play Minecraft. Anyway, fine, come on. <laughs> Lisa says, what? You're not watching the watch. That's a very good point. When I've got the computer in front of me, I just look at the the computer thing. But, uh, yeah. <sighs> James Duffin says, Ben, you should do a collab with Matt Esley. He's built a couple of bases and references you loads. Every single time I meet Matt... I say, yo, Matt, we need to do something uh, since he had like 15,000 subs, literally brand new channel. And I've been saying, yeah, we should do something together. And he never has the time. I never have the time. It just has not worked. I would love to work with him. He's a cool, cool dude. Um, and then obviously COVID and collaborations just stopped anyway. Oh, I don't know. Adam Bartron says, Highline Guitars had an interesting technique for sounding a run using polyfiller. Okay. <laughs> Morganian Evolution says, By the time they get to content producing, providing age, YouTube will have either gone by the wayside or totally removed the ability to make money on it. I think that ad revenue is something that's an issue. Um the whole advert ecosystem is changing and growing and moving and uh and yes it is more about you guys do you guys trust me to tell you the truth i use triton routers because i absolutely rate triton routers and if one of you goes and buys a tractor writer because I've said go and buy one, you will not be disappointed. Short of, you know, a seriously unlucky something. Okay. Um, and that is where I think YouTubers and stroke or uh, influencers, whatever the platform happens to be, <sighs> that makes it a viable sort of living. I, I think that... Yeah, adverts, traditional adverts, um, video adverts are still better than banners and stuff like that. It's it's a difficult world. That being said, my daughter is is turning thirteen in October, and thirteen is the age at which you are allowed to have a YouTube channel, according to YouTube. So, so yes, it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa. Yeah, it's imminent. She wants to do Minecraft and stuff, and I'm, of course, going to support her in any way I can. <sighs> Lisa says, not that watch. The watch. Of course I watched the watch. It's one of the four series I've watched. I finished it. Like, oh, Lisa. Yes, the Terry Pratchett sort of punk-inspired the watch. Um... It was both incredible and infuriating and incredible. Yes, I said both and then said three things. But uh, anyway, yes, I watched that. Um, and that's that. Heart of Oak says, I actually tried the Highline Guitars method and it failed miserably. Note that he does not show the result after he washes off the paste. I hate it when people do a tutorial and then freaking lie to you. And it does, there's it not so much in the making world, but anyway. <laughs> Lucifer says, when are we getting our member logos for the extras channel? Uh, I have lost track of what's happening here. 
Um, I have no idea. Um, it's, I, I'm not even sure if members are memberships are allowed on this channel or, or what. Um, I, I wish that I didn't have to do the stream on this channel. But it is what it is. Uh, James Duffin says, I'll remind Map about a, a colander when I take the OSB guitar up to workshop for his cameraman slash editor. Um, colander translates to collaboration. Yeah, seriously, tell him to get in touch. I would love to do something with him. Um, Jeff's guitar says my grandmaster's favorite is Minecraft. Thirteen years old, uh, Minecraft. I've got no issue with Minecraft. I think that uh, for the most part, it's a fantastic game, uh, and uh, it's the world that they live in now. Uh, the whole digital thing. But anyway, SC guitar says Chris at Highline seems like a stand-up guy, uh, so I'm surprised at that. I'm not. I'm not digging him I, I've not watched the video I'm just saying in general if it doesn't work tell the people that you're making the video for that hey this didn't work maybe I need to do it this way or this way or that way um, if you if you don't then don't uh, don't make the video period okay guys anyway I'm running I am running low on energy uh, we've been going for more than an hour now uh, Jeff's guitar says granddaughter. I, I thought grandmaster is actually quite a cool little idea. I just got, got images of your, your granddaughter walking around in a sort of uh, um, Mason's outfit sort of thing with the, uh, the secret handshakes and the rings and stuff and saying, grandfather, do what you're told or whatever. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. Okay. Uh, da -dum -ba -dum. Here we go. I thought there was Mark Milligan question. Have you considered adding fret tang nippers to your store or do you prefer another technique? I have considered it. I've tried to buy it many times. Um, I've They are complicated things to manufacture and uh, essentially it's one of about 80 to 100 tools that we need to add that we will be adding. Uh, it's just well a certain little pandemic utterly messed with all of my plans and uh, it should have been done divergent guitars says question no divergent guitars actually says cheeseburgers then question about to do my first truss rod routing i own the big triton tra001 router that sir is a statement not a question uh perfect um it depends if you've got squared end squared edges and that's perfect then use the <sighs> use the fence of the router to go down and a quarter inch bit if not you're going to have to get the kit and a template and I can never remember what those damn things are called it offsets the thing and follows the thing. Maybe I should go to bed. It's been a long day. Uh -huh. James Duffin says, Ben, do you think OSB uh, would work for the top of a semi-hollow body guitar? I've been asked to make a thin line teddy with an OSB top. OSB is oriented strand board and <sighs> telly, flat top, OSB. I don't think you can get uh, OSB in anything thinner than about 18 millimeters. So, I mean, that's a that's a problem. Yeah, that is a. Hmm. If it's that thick, we'll be fine. I really don't think that that's a wise thing, though. It's it's yeah. Stephen says, "What is your?" What is your favorite Marvel film slash TV show? This can be uh, include anything in or not in the MCU or any 
of the series, Loki, One Division, Agents of Shield, etc. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to dignify that with an answer. I, pretty, I particularly enjoyed Loki. I really did, but. Um, It's got to be the first Iron Man movie, really. I suppose. Uh, if you could build a guitar based off one Marvel movie and have the stars of said movie in your build videos, which movie slash who would it be? It would 100% be based on Thor, based on Asgard, um, based on the uh, the Rainbow Bridge thingy, the, the room at the end. Uh, and, of course, Scourge would <laughs> have to be in it. Um, and it would have to be called, it would be two guitars, a Dez and a Troy, of course. Or a guitar and an amp combo. How's about that? But based on the beautiful designs and the inside of that room, uh, at the, yeah, that would be, that would be incredible. Uh, Dimitri sent five euros and said, Ben, thanks again for a lovely evening. You look really tired. Looking forward to the next live stream. I really am. Um, there's, there's a hell of a lot going on. It's all mostly good stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah. Stormbringer, making Purple Heart purple again. Long shot. Try fire. Uh, at one point, I did a Shusugi Bun technique on Purple Heart and then sanded it back. And we did actually get a much darker purple, but it was very vibrant. I can't remember how long it lasted because I never actually finished building that guitar. That was a test. Um, yeah, there we go. Lucifer sent five Canadian dollars. Says thanks for sharpening my new vintage number six. Haha, <laughs> it's so pleasant to use. Have a good night, buddy. I, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad you got that. Um, what do you think of the uh, the repair on the uh, uh, end of the tote? That was, uh, yeah. I fixed the handle as well, and I was quite happy with that. There's like at least two extra pieces of rosewood there, and it. It looks like the whole thing is just one piece. It's great. Um, but yeah, thank you for your support there. Uh, Vintage Tool Shop also has a, a sale going on at the moment. <sighs> Ergo Hog via Discord says, uh, does a neck need to have an angle to have a fall away on the upper frets? No, no, not at all. Fall away is to do with the strings, not the break angle. So the, the motion of the string itself, as you're playing it, as you move up the up the fretboard you need fall away to to counteract that motion essentially and so that you don't buzz as you go higher up uh ben Tyman says uh, what do you think of the idea for using hardwood dowels instead of metal screws i want to glue in the neck then carve away the waist will it be strong enough well just glue in the neck yeah you, I mean, adding extra dowels in will 100% make things stronger, but I think that it's engineering overkill and not necessarily required. But uh, yeah, it works and should be done and can be done. And uh, if it can be done, it should be done. This is my problem. I have an idea. I think, oh, I can do that. And I'm like, oh, Ben, chill, dude. Slow down. You don't need to do so much. But I do. Okay. Divergent Guitars has sent a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Um, and said, thanks for the answer. Are we routing the trust slot? Much appreciated. Have a great night and get some rest. Okay, I will. I shall. Indeed. I shall. In a bit. A little bit. We'll think about it. <sighs> mm. 
9mm OSB. Hmm. From James Duffin. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Richard Garnish is saying bark, bark. I didn't even hear the dogs bark. <laughs> okay, all the usernames I want to retake and says, in your opinion, does the neck angle and bridge affect the sound and playability of the guitar? Yes, to a certain extent, it depends on what you're after. If you've got... Yes, it does, but it's, you know, within expected parameters. If you're playing a Strat-type guitar, you know how it's going to feel. If you're playing a jazz guitar, that's got a completely different feel to where the, how deep you can use your plectrum, for example. Uh, and, uh, and that does also affect how the strings feel. I think. Physics. Physics is a weird one. But uh, yeah, it's definitely... Uh, uh, it does. But slightly, so it's not an issue. Okay. Anyway, look, I am going to go now, guys. Um, hold on. Matthias Lindgren says, what is a material you have not worked with that you would want to work with in a guitar build? That's a very good question. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So... I am I'm going to be playing with I want to use composites a little bit more. I want to experiment with recycling uh, fabric and basically making recycled fabric micarta and I am going to use that to make the entire neck and fretboard. I hope, uh, as well as the support struts, I hope, for um, the next version of the GGBO guitar. And uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be incredibly attractive. So, so there we go. Damn fine question to end the evening on. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate the support. Okay. Um, Anyway, guys, I really appreciate your support. I will see you in the morning. I'm repeating, I'm repeating myself and this is not good. I will not see you in the morning. I will see you next week. Have a fantastic uh, evening. Have a fantastic week coming up. Um, I'm going to be cleaning my workshop and organizing things. And I'm really looking forward to having this nice and tidy and done. Uh, I will also be doing various accounts and meetings and all sorts of chaos but uh, in the meantime i will be dreaming about guitars uh, 1971 says my carter out of old denim yummy indeed um, okay guys good night i love you i will see you next week cheerio <laughs>